amongst themselves for a 30 minutes, for around about 30 minutes. And then we will follow up with a 30 minutes question and answer sessions. And in, at this point, you'll have an opportunity to put forward your questions um, yourself to the panel. So I'll be uh, calling the names and then you'll get an opportunity to, um, you know, to ask your questions. I think some of you may have submitted questions before, so the panel will try. We've only got a, a short slot, which I'll, so I'll, I'll keep quiet in a minute, but then the panel will try and answer all your questions to the best they can. Uh, so we'll try and fit quite a lot in. So without further ado, I will call on the first speaker, Dr. Arde. May I ask you to lead on your five minutes provocation? Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, um, everyone. Good morning. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, good morning, Councillor Williams and to the rest of the panel. Um, it's really good to see everyone and thanks for everyone's taking the time to be here um, on a Thursday morning. Um, I guess we're living in a really turbulent time right now um, in terms of how we define Britishness <clears throat> and belonging. The hostile environment is thriving um, at the expense of um, black and ethnic minority people. So um, it's kind of really interesting to think about this idea of history and in particular uh, British history and what comprises that history and the kind of historical amnesia that ensues when we're talking about um, history, generally speaking, which completely omits the kind of contribution of, of black and ethnic minorities to empire, British legacy, British infrastructure, the economy, all of those things over many centuries. So I guess the thing I kind of want to talk about is really what that looks like in our educational spaces. And I suppose the thing that becomes really pertinent when considering these things is that sense of belonging within the classroom and education in, as itself is a microcosm of society. So it's this microcosm of society, yet we have this canon of education that isn't actually reflective of a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-diverse society. So when individuals are going into that classroom space, there is a disconnect and an absence in terms of belonging because you're not actually seeing aspects of your own diaspora, indigenous populace, lived experience reflected in the curriculum that you're engaging with. And I think one of the things that becomes really important is the impact upon attainment. Now, you know, black students, ethnic minority students against, you know, what is inherently a, a, an institutionally racist and disadvantaging education system have flourished, you know, have flourished over the last 50 to 60 years, as is kind of noted in the Robbins report, the Scarman report, and other reports that have resurfaced since then, probably most latterly the McPherson report in 1999. But one of the recommendations from the McPherson report in 1999 in terms of becoming racially literate and racially cognizant was this kind of understanding around embedding black history within um, our national curriculum as a British history not as a separate history devolved of kind of a white dominant Eurocentric narrative. So I think that becomes really really important because what we are seeing is an education system that is systematically failing particularly young black boys um, and I think it's also important to kind of acknowledge that um, it's to everyone's benefit to have this kind of type of knowledge because, you know, it, it, it kind of facilitates the society we live in. The whole purpose of education in many ways is to prepare people to take their place within society and education is failing all of its kind of um, inhabitants by not providing them with the tools, the information, they need to circumnavigate or to navigate a multicultural and diverse society. From a, from a, I guess, an attainment point of view, what we are seeing is that absence of um, cognition and relation to looking at a curriculum that actually I'm seeing people that look like me that move beyond kind of entertainment music, you know, that that's always been kind of funneled into one area. And I think it's really important that we think about the contributions of black and ethnic minority people, particularly over the last hundred years to the British context. I think in terms of attainment, what we are seeing are deficits that really kind of really reveal themselves, I guess, not only in secondary education, 
but kind of all the way through to higher education and what we're seeing is that while we continue to have you know ethnic minority students going to university in record numbers just under half the university population in the uk are black and ethnic minorities the outcomes still continue to be pretty poor in terms of the actual attainment gap which for the higher education sector a little bit remains at um, 23 uh, percent and there have been kind of institutions that have managed to reduce that to varying degrees but fundamentally what we're still kind of struggling with is that deficit in terms of how people access education um, and how we omit particular types of education and the centrality of a dominant white eurocentric knowledge canon which completely omits and marginalizes different types of knowledge and in doing that in having those kind of gatekeepers and those kind of custodians what we're actually doing is further placing black and ethnic minority people on the periphery of educational spaces and having better educational outcomes so i think the most important thing is really you know for us as a collective and moving forward to think about how we change those spaces to ensure better outcomes for um, young black people and ethnic minorities um i think the pipeline between education and prison is one that probably needs to be kind of forensically more examined because the high exclusion rates of young black boys for example um, between the ages of 13 and 16 um, do kind of lead them on that pathway to that and we need to think about how the education system is actually facilitating um, that because we still you know in terms of the 2011 consensus 14 percent of the population are black and ethnic minorities three percent are black but you still have a huge percentage of that three percent that make up a lot of the prison population in the UK. So it's kind of thinking about how we disrupt those patterns. And I think thinking about aspects of curriculum attainment, how we establish belonging, belonging pedagogically in the classroom become really essential in terms of doing that. And I think that's me. So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. So thank you for your time. I'm really grateful. Hi everyone. Um, I think I'm next, am I? Martha, you're definitely next. Please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You just appeared on screen. Sorry about that, but that's an introduction. <laughs> Hi everybody, this is Martha Holder, <laughs> one of our primary head teachers. Uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself properly, Martha. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, it's a real privilege to be on this panel and to be asked to be here today. I think that um, in terms of what's happening, I'd like to just reiterate and just share my experiences of COVID and of Black Lives Matter. So I was deeply, deeply shocked by what happened in terms of, I wouldn't say a murder, I would say an execution that took place in front of us. Um, and many, millions of us were able to see that. And I think that um, in terms of that, it's really important that the work that we're doing does continue. And I know that that's been reiterated by most of the panel with regards to that. I'd like to say that um, I think that Greenwich is doing a great job in acknowledging what took place. They had the um, installation um, back in, I think it was June, down by um, Tesco's, which had the big poster on the floor for Black Lives Matter. And as a school, we really do try to tackle those difficult conversations with our children. So during COVID-19, we set some homework for the children. It was via Google because obviously not all children were in school, where children really got to understand the difference between Black Lives Matters and All Lives Matters. And it's about us really being brave and taking a risk and actually having those conversations and giving the children the platform to share their experiences and to really make informed decisions, not just stereotypes or reiterate what they've heard as well. I think that um, in terms of education, I feel really optimistic about education. I think that there's so many opportunities for us to really change how um, we can change how things happened in the past and how we can shape the future as a school. We don't do Black History Month per se because we think it's part of the whole curriculum. So we have diversity throughout the year. This year, um, this term, we're doing diversity, looking at diversity, power, um, power and politics. 
and it's throughout the school from year one reading the story Amazing Grace to year six looking at really challenging texts. So I think that there is a lot of work that we can do and a lot of things that we can do to really empower our children. But we do know that the statistics, we do know fundamentally that something happens in primary school and something happens when the children get to secondary school. And it's a conversation that has been going on for decades, I would say, when I was um, learning to, um, at um, university, the Swan Report, um, you know, spoke about the disparity between young black boys and the education system. And I think it's really important that we have people from diverse backgrounds, that children see themselves as educators. And I'd like to add on with what Adele said, that it goes beyond a superstar. It goes beyond somebody singing. It goes beyond somebody being a sports person. But we look at those different industries that black people are marginalized in and actually challenge that and allow children to have experience of people from different backgrounds doing different um different roles we were really fortunate um in terms of um the children in our school that we were able to um work with a lady called grace who set um who has um put together a great um great maths great game race to infinity you know children need to experience know that their experiences are acknowledged and the only way that really does happen really fundamentally is if they can relate to people and if people can really recognize their experiences so in terms of you know secondary school children i think and the experience of our black children in secondary school it's really important that we speak to them so that we know so that it's not just a panel making decisions but their voice is heard and i think we have to have aspirations for all of our children and i you know be really ambitious and fight for what they they deserve Children at Margrave deserve the best education. I know that Greenwich has high expectations of its um, children. You know, the director, Florence Kroll, has set up the Black Lives Matter Working Party, which says a lot. Um, and we will be tackling really difficult issues and challenging issues, and it will be uncomfortable. And I think we have to be able to get uncomfortable to move forward. But I would like to hope that, you know, we are all really ambitious for the children. and. I know that I can speak for Margrave um, School that we only expect the best for our children. We want to give them the best. And I can say that about other schools in Greenwich as well. So there is a lot of work to do. Um, it is a challenge, but I think that there is, you know, the possibility to really make that fundamental change and give children a love of education and for them to realize that it can really take them to real far, far gone places. The world's getting smaller now with COVID-19. We can't travel as much, but I still want children to be ambitious about traveling and going to other places and being in careers that they may not have considered before. Thank you very much, Ms. Holder. Sorry about that. I didn't introduce you properly. That's all right. Uh, thank you. Just thank you, Dr. Ade, for um, sharing your um, five minutes thoughts. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite Dr. Jivraj to speak to us. Is Dr. Jivraj here? I can't see her online. We need to unmute. Hi, hi. Yes, I was just waiting to be unmuted. <laughs> okay. I think it's work now. Uh, can everyone hear me? Someone give me a thumbs up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, great. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak to Greenwich um, today. So I'm from the University of Kent. I'm based in the law school there and we have a um, campus in Chatham Maritime along with the University of Kent so the, there's the connections there um, you know which are particularly personal to me because I've spent a long time teaching on that campus and knowing um, getting to know a lot of students who come there from the Greenwich vicinity. <clears throat> So um, I think someone's going to share my slides for me because I've got a few slides. Um, could you load up the slides, please, and share your screen? Excellent. Thanks, Sam. Great. Um, so uh, as I said, I'm in the law school and I teach um, public law, which is one of the uh, it's the flagship module that all our incoming students um, do in their first year and that they all have. It's a compulsory module. 
And so in a sense, and we have a cohort between 450 to 700, depending on the year. So it's a real privilege, I think, to be able to uh, have uh, access to these amazing uh, young uh, minds who are eager to learn and have their um, thinking really challenged um, in this new university context. And um, as part of um, that module, I introduced them into uh, various comparative and international um, uh, ideas of constitutional law, um, how democracy works, um, how the history of democracy, but not just in relation to what we're used to hearing about. So, for example, the French and the American revolutions and how the Enlightenment period gave rise to democracy as we understand it now in the modern era, but also in relation to uh, post-apartheid South Africa, um, in relation to um, indigenous moves towards um, uh, constitutionality um, in South America, um, the slave rebellions in Haiti, which gave rise to the first constitution, modern constitution as we know it. And so they get this kind of <laughs> barrage from me of all this information that they're not expecting because it's so different from um, what they're used to in terms of a very yeah, white curriculum, essentially. And so by the time they reach my third year module, which is an optional module, I get uh, students who are really keen to put, you know, get their teeth into this material in much more detail. And that module is um, race, religion and law. And more recently, we've been um, taking a very intersectional approach to it. So thinking about um, the intersections between race, uh, religion, gender and sexuality as well. And um, what I hear by the time, you know, the third year students reach me is, wow, you know, why did we not do more of this in first year? Why don't I know about this history, about how the law was constituted in the, you know, and how it's perpetuated so much violence against black people and people of color across the world. Um, and not only that, so it's not just, you know, the Zong case, which talks about, of course, um, um, how slave traders were compensated for supposed loss of cargo, basically murdering of uh, slaves on board these slave ships, um, yeah. but also um, in relation to knowledge that um, is, is out there coming from uh, amazing lawyers in, so if you could just go back a, a one slide amazing lawyers in um africa asia and that they don't know about this knowledge that is produced and i heard claire alexander recently who i know works with jason um and she was saying that she's an educational uh, education professor and she was saying that you know we have this perception that that information isn't out there we need to go digging for black history or black scholars uh, of this body of scholarship that we're so fixated in the fact that the canon the white canon is uh, all there is and that's simply not true um, and so bringing this other knowledge uh, to students um, at all levels, not just in higher education, but, you know, at all levels, which wonderful organizations like the Black Curriculum, uh, Kids of Colour and other initiatives are now doing and calling upon the government, uh, I think is really, really essential. So as a lawyer, I'm just going to kind of uh, remind, because I, I actually have to do this with my own colleagues in, in higher education, in law schools, and remind them that, you know, um, we are under a legal duty, under the Equality Act, under the public sector equality duty, um, to, to provide education in a non-discriminatory way. Um, certainly in higher education, we've had the recent Equality and Human Rights Commission inquiry into racial harassment. Um, and this is really, you know, the latest report on a plethora, uh, a barrage of reports. So we know, we know there's a problem. We also know, of course, uh, about attainment gaps, both in um, 
um, primary and secondary education, but also um, in, in higher education. And uh, of course, the terminology that's used is attainment gaps. And actually, the first time I heard that um, term used in a departmental meeting, I was absolutely outraged. Um, and um, I was thinking, what, what are you talking about? Um, so I prefer to use the language of attain not even attainment disparities, but awarding disparities, because the problem, as many uh, have, have written about Jason, uh, Robbie Shilliam, and many others, is that it's, it's contingent on this idea of students as somehow lacking, uh, somehow having a cultural and educational and other forms of deficit. Um, and actually, you know, in that discourse, there is no mention of institutional racism, of systemic racism. And really, that's what we that's, you know, part of what I'm doing is trying to kind of shift um, some of the focus onto that. And I'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, please, could you move to the next slide? So um, I was awarded some funding by the Socio-Legal Studies Association to put together um, the, the resource that, is, uh, that I recently um, uh, launched. It's available. It's an anti-racist legal pedagogy resource. It's um, relevant, though, beyond just the law. Um, and um, it's, it's available to, uh, for free to download. And I think the link is on the next slide. And as part of that, I interviewed um, law teachers who I knew, you know, were already doing amazing critical um, scholarship and teaching. And one of the interviewees said to me, you know, the attainment gap, as it's, as it's known, is definitely a product of what we teach. What we can do in the university, and I'd say education more broadly, is to reflect on what we're teaching, how we're teaching, and also how we're assessing. And when I saw this uh, photo from one of the um, uh, protests, the BLM protests, it really, you know, it, it talks to that point that Martha uh, uh, mentioned about discomfort, which I'm going to come back to. You know, actually, yes, people find it scary, but, you know, we need to remind ourselves that as educators, it's a privilege to educate yourself about racism instead of actually having to experience it. So let's contemplate and reflect on that for a moment. Next slide, please. So here are some of my wonderful students. Um, so the project Decolonizing the Curriculum is uh, unique in the sense that most Decolonizing the Curriculum projects are, are either student movements um, or institutional initiatives that you know come under the guise of equality diversity and inclusion or um, student success as they're more recently calling it this project which i um, uh, initiated was with my students if we could just stay back on the last slide for a minute uh, this project i initiated with the students that i teach because as this discourse around attainment gaps was coming out and becoming bigger i was getting really angry and i was discussing it with students in uh, class because it didn't reflect my experience of the students that i teach and so i put together a funding bid for um uh some innovation um in teaching uh, uh, funds and we were awarded it and um, essentially um, the students conducted their own research so what was really interesting and uh, innovative about this project is that I we or myself and my colleagues trained the students to become researchers so they went through a whole process from ethics approval to um, literature reviews to uh, writing skills research skills focus group training skills and then they led these focus groups with the other students and and they led them in what we called decolonial cafe style environments and they led they chose the theme so they had specific groups for uh, black men um, Muslim women, um, around mental health, around well-being, international students. So they really focused in on some of the um, issues that they felt were most pressing for them. And they created this manifesto um, and they launched it at a, um, 
uh, a conference in March 2019 um, and the link on the bottom of the slide there you can kind of see the manifesto footage from the conference and the other resources that they've created so a reading list and so on <laughs> And they went on to actually train staff. So they, they you know, their expertise and their um, uh, uh, knowledge went into then training staff, both within our university um, and also uh, externally. And actually one of the students, Lisa, who you can see there presenting the manifesto to the Speaker of the House of Commons, he, um, she um, has recorded um, a, a lovely video um, about the project, which you can see um, on that page and recounts it in more detail. So I would, um, I would encourage you to go and see for yourself, you know, someone who started off as an undergraduate student, went through quite a, you know, a difficult time, is, it, has been part of this process and is now completing her master's in research so you know as Jason said there's that pipeline and the other wonderful thing about the project was that it really um, continued uh, or helped to continue the pipeline and the interaction between the students themselves creating a sense of belonging and taking up space and there's more I can say um, about how we did how we went about creating um, what we call principal spaces rather than safe spaces because we can't maybe this is a bit loyally but we can't guarantee safe spaces so you know working through principles and all the information is on the web page uh, next slide please so coming back to this idea of discomfort um, as we were engaging in this project um, there was you know everything that we were doing with the students to get the word out there but also a lot of law school teachers were coming to me and saying listen Sarai you know what you're doing there looks great how can I do something how can I get started so there's a real kind of sense of feeling stuck and um, um, you know not knowing how to get started and that's why I put together this resource which um, uh, has a set of prompts readings cases um, for law school teachers for teachers to think about in getting started in their foundational um, subjects where they often think oh you know we don't have enough time I'm already overloaded so it's a really it's meant to be a kind of I was going to say gentle but maybe uh, it's meant to be a getting started um, process for those who really um, have the motivation but don't know how or where to get started next slide please um, and I think a key thing that comes out of the policy that we really need to um, remember, uh, and in particular this, um, this report that came out in 2019 and in the bottom corner there in the black hoodie you'll see one of my students, Joy Olobayega, um, and she, you know in, in the report they make five recommendations and one of the recommendations is universities need to have conversations about race. And this includes whiteness because race is not just about, you know, people of color and someone else's issue. Actually, it's white people's issue, you know, whiteness and systemic racism and um, leadership within these institutions is an issue of whiteness. And we really need to look at that. So next slide, please. So a big chunk of the um, resource is also about how to get started in looking at the issues uh, where you are what are the blockages um, people are obviously uh, you know think they know what racism is um, and recently there's the term racial microaggressions kind of coming around and you've got the work of people like Nicola Rollock and uh, the brilliant uh, work by uh, Remy Joseph Salisbury on this issue of mi racial microaggressions um, and what I would say is that we really need to acknowledge actually how we're all in, you know, complicit in, um, in these behaviours in various ways. So this defensiveness and discomfort about actually willing to acknowledge how we are complicit, that really is the first hurdle, um, you know, before we can get to thinking about how we can change our curriculum and all the rest of it. Actually, I would really, I really think that we need in all my time of kind of doing this work, I really think that we need to reflect on where we were, at, where we are at and what we're engaged in. And actually students are telling us this all the time, you know, I'm not just uncomfortable, um, 
with what I'm being taught. I'm uncomfortable in the classroom, how I'm being treated, how I'm being profiled. Um, final slide, please. I think it's the final slide. So the uh, penultimate slide. Um, so this is um, a wonderful kind of diagram that the students and artists and other experts um, came together to put together um, as a kind of process, a stepping stone process that is continual. So it's not, you know, a journey you begin and then you end. No, it's continual. We're all always on this process. Um, final slide, please. And there's much more on that um, stepping stones that you can see on the web page. So please do have a look. I'm sure I've gone over time. So I just want to finish with um, this event, which is actually happening this afternoon. And it's the is to celebrate the launch of the uh, the book that came out of the decolonizing um, the curriculum project. So we worked with the students who were part of the project to co-author this book. And they are so excited to be co-authors, to uh, have a publication. And if you have time, do uh, tune in to the, um, to the launch because you'll, you'll see them talking about um, their experiences, what they've achieved, but also what still needs to be done. So um, yes, it's all I can say really to end is that it's been an abs it is an absolute privilege to work with um, our students and we owe it to them to give them the opportunity to realize this, this amazing potential that they have. And as they say to me, you know, Soraya, I need to self-actualize. Thank you. Thank you very much, doc, uh, Dr. Jivraj. Um, a lot to take in um, there, um, a lot um, of uh, points that we could even follow up on. So really interesting uh, piece of work. I uh, just want to say, I just want to um, I just want to recognize um, that you've acknowledged in your work that the deficit between the attainment has a lot to do with the award system. And that is something that uh, we all need to uh, pay attention to. Um, at this moment, uh, without any further ado, I just want to finally um, bring to, uh, to your... Uh, is she there? Sorry, I did say... All right, uh, just Miss Okamuna, please, um, if you could introduce yourself, you've got five minutes. Sorry if it's, um, want to cut it short, the previous speaker took a, a little, maybe a minute or two of your time. Yeah. So I do apologize if yours will um, go, but I'll stop you. Uh, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, it's fine because everybody has actually covered so much of what I wanted to say, which is perfect. I also want to thank you for pronouncing my name properly I thought I loved it there was a there was a pause of a few seconds and I thought let's see what's going to happen it was amazing well done thank you um yes as I said everyone's covered a lot of the points that I wanted to raise but I think um I will just start by saying my background actually is in African literature and drama I'm Nigerian it was really funny this morning when Adele said uh congratulations to all the Nigerians out there on Nigerian Independence Day, I had completely forgotten. And I think that this is a reminder of the ways in which we, our cultural memory, our historical memory about things that are important to us can sometimes slip by and can be hidden. And the reason I start there is that a lot of my work, because I started teaching in African literature and I currently teach critical race theory, a lot of my work focuses on the philosophical and epistemological questions related to literature and history and black philosophy. The reason it's important for me is that as somebody said earlier, we as non-white people are in an arc of history. Particularly, I'm going to focus on African people and people from the African diaspora. It's not because I don't think other people's histories are important or significant. I think they are deeply, but I think one of the dangers that we have when we are ensconced within Eurocentric systems is that our histories can become muddled and thrown together. The tag BAME for me is not always useful because it can sometimes hide a plethora of inequalities and injustices, particularly when we think about black women's experiences. So we do talk a lot about 
black boys experiences, but we don't talk about how do black girls experience the education system? How do they overcome problems of, um, you know, gender and racial disadvantage? We don't talk about how they experience violence, both epistemological and physical violence because they are black and women. It's really important for me as somebody who's interested in gender to say maybe when we start talking about decolonizing the curriculum we must also start foregrounding the experiences of black women. Anyway as I said my kind of philosophical approach to this is to say we are part of, we participate in an arc of history. Our danger is that we tend to treat the African or African Caribbean experience as if it began in 1948. Every time I read an article, it says the wind rush docked in 1948. And I think, look, black history is older than 1948. So I think that we need to start thinking out of ourselves as having an ancient historical experience. We need to start thinking of this part of our experience, unpleasant as it is at times, but it also has its joys. Let's face it, it's not all misery. Um, we need to start thinking about that as part of a long process. It's part of a tra trajectory. And, you know, my favorite author at the moment, Ayikwe Ama, talks about the fact that we need to look back. We need to look back to consider the ways that what we have experienced brings value to us. We need to start thinking about how the value that is brought to us through our experience can be taken into the future. So we need to think not in the teleological ways that Eurocentric history functions. We shouldn't be thinking about past, present, future. We should be thinking about the ways in which they are amalgamated, the ways in which the past informs the present and that in turn informs the future. For me, that's quite critical because I, you know, like other speakers, want to start thinking about the ways in which we are all creating history all of the time. History is not the preserve of very rich or powerful people, ordinary people, black women who are fighting every day to prevent their black boys from being excluded from schools are actually creating history. They may not see themselves as historical beings because they don't write their histories. So when I teach critical race theory to my students, I emphasize the importance of writing diaries, keeping notes, writing your histories. In a hundred years time, in 200 years time, I would be very saddened if the history that we focus on is the history of social services records or criminal justice records. We have a history, we participate in and are producing this society, but it is our responsibility to make sure that we keep records and narrate um, our histories and we leave that for the benefit of future generations. So as this was a provocation, a provocation piece, I don't know what that means, but I think I'll give it a go. Um, I thought where I'm at, where my mind is focusing at the moment, as an intellectual, as a theorist, is I am wondering whether it is possible it is possible for us to decolonize the institution. James Baldwin says something very important. He says, when you are attempting to reform the institutions, whatever institutions they are, are you attempting to join a burning house? Now, I don't want to join a burning house. I am wondering whether we need to start thinking, is it time in the 21st century for us to start thinking about building our own institutions. One of the problems that you have when you participate in the reform of other people's institutions is firstly, you don't have control over the time scale of change. This may take 10, 20, might take 100, 200 years, who can say? So you don't have control over the time scale. The second thing that I would say is that you don't have control over the agenda. And I think that our agenda might be not that we just want to focus on black boys and attainment, that's important, but we might want an agenda that focuses on our humanity. 
Can we create a world in which violence no longer exists? Can we create a world in which people are not oppressed because of their economic circumstances? Can we create a world in which the actual physical world that we possess, that we are constantly abusing through um, the exploitation of resources, can we create a world for future generations in which these problems no longer exist? So I think when I say, can we move away from the idea of reform? My favorite author, Harold Cruz asks, do we need to focus on rebellion or should we focus on revolution? And the question is one of reform. And when I say revolution, I say rethinking the way that we think about the world, changing our consciousness, shifting our consciousness to ask for more, to request more, and to bring all of our experiences to the human table, as it were, to change the way in which history progresses. That's all I have to say, guys. Thank you so much for your time.